children can be dismissed now to children's church and i'll invite the rest of you big kids to turn in your bibles to the book of first john first john chapter four this morning first john four we're so glad you're out this morning on a cold weekend and uh so first john chapter four So 1 John 4 deals with this idea and this theme of discernment, spiritual discernment. There's some parallels from this from chapter 2 and the doctrinal test of uh, a true believer. But this one deals a little bit more, and I think this will be incredibly practical and helpful to you. I know it's been helpful to me as I've studied this. I want to start off with a question that's there on the screen. How do you know if someone is speaking for God or not? When a friend comes and says they got this new book and it, uh, with the spiritual message in it, how do you know and how it's transformed their lives and it's been so great, how do you know if that's from God or not? Or when someone says that they've been listening to some new teacher online or on YouTube or a podcast and how it's just revolutionized the way they've seen God in the Bible or someone's been coming to their house for a Bible study um, and how do you know if that is from God or not or when a when a friend or someone comes and says hey God told me this or God I have a message from God or someone comes and says I think this and I prayed about it um, and therefore that is what it is or it's from God or I was thinking about doing this and I prayed and now I have peace about it um, And then how, so how do you know if that is from God or not? And that is brings us into this idea of spiritual discernment That is very important. It is very important And this passage te- speaks to us about it. What is the authority from which we? Um, draw on these things and see our modern idea uh, um, has has changed many things about what we see as the authority Um, we have authorities of various teachers we have authorities of um, um, our own personal identities they think some things have led up to this you know historically the um, the industrial revolution kind of shifted things for people um, in many many ways uh, affects people spiritually as well before the industrial revolution your where you lived what you did for an occupation um, Probably who you would marry all of those things were kind of set for you. You know, you were born a Smith who smithed in the town of Smithville and you're probably gonna live and die and marry a girl in that same Smith family and work as a Smith because your grandpa and dad and all were Smiths and and that's kind of settles it. And this idea of the, uh, the uh, Industrial Revolution changed this. Now people will have to discern things like, what is God's will for my life? What is my vocation? Uh, the French Revolution kind of also thought as ideas of the individual above this. And, and what happened was all of these, and even in the modern idea of secular psychology, still would want talk of spirituality divorced from the biblical text itself. And so shifting away from objective truth of the Bible to a subjective experience. And so this is really sets up an, an outline for what modern culture, that we have an authority of feelings with a language of spirituality. And we see this all the way from Ralph Waldo Emerson to the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous um, to anything you could watch in a, in a TV show or series today. Um, And we have assumptions of acceptance. Um, And the irony is that as culture and humans have grown in this idea of individualism, things like anxiety and depression um, have drastically increased as well as the rage against the God of the Bible. And often when people say something, they appeal to their highest authority. Well, I just feel. Um, And so how do we know if that feeling is from God or not? Uh, How do we know this? Um, And so we, this emotion, the exaltation of the individual or a false teacher around the corner or on the, um, that you saw in a, in a book somewhere, how do we know that 
is from God or not. And this text speaks to us. So let's read the text together, verses 1 through 4, and then we'll dive in. I ask God to help us and dive in. This is God's word. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus is not from God, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world. Little children, you are from God, and you have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Father, would you help us now? to grow in the area of spiritual discernment. Make us a discerning people. Lord, I pray that we would know truth. Truth would set us free. Lord, we want to know the truth. Lord, you have spoken, and we want to understand it. Lord, there are a million voices vying for our attention today, and we struggle with it. So, Lord, would you, by this text, open our eyes to draw us to truth in our Christian life and how we discern truth from error, and especially for the one who has not yet surrendered to following Jesus as Lord of their life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we see this um, this section divided up into a few different categories that we'll have as kind of an outline. The verse 1, we see the need for discernment. Verse 2, we'll see the basis for discernment. And then verses 4 and 5, we'll see the fruit of discernment. But I'm going to give Uh, three or four just very practical things as we walk through the need for discernment, the basis for discernment, and the fruit of discernment in this message on spiritual discernment. And the first practical thing there that comes up is in verse one, where it just tells us, it commands, well, before he does that, he starts off with that word, beloved. I love that word. And, And John has used that word over and over and over in this. It's a good lesson for us. It's a good reminder for those of you that would teach or lead a small group that those that are in our care need to be reminded that they are loved. The agape toy, that those that are loved of God. Remind, beloved, and then he gives this command. So you are loved by God. Hey, you, beloved, beloved. Isn't that an awesome thing? We're part of the beloved. Don't you need, you know, feel that? I mean, I hope you feel that when you read that, when that's read, that you feel like God in a sense, not that the basis is, the basis is this truth, but that, that you are loved. You need to remind yourself, not because of what you've done, not because of who you are, but because of God. He has made you in his image, as we looked last week, and he set his affection upon you. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. So don't believe everything you hear. You get that? Don't believe if someone calls your phone and lets you know about your car's extended warranty, don't believe it. I, I, I get regularly phone calls and emails about student loans. And I'm like, I mixed paint and did a bunch of crazy Joe jobs so I didn't have one of those. Quit calling me. I don't believe you that I have, you know. And, and, and th- th- that is don't believe. And take that from that realm to the spiritual realm. Don't believe everything you hear. Beloved, don't believe every spirit. Don't be, so Christian church, person, member of Linwood Community Church, don't be spiritually naive. We should not be spiritually naive people that believe every wind of doctrine. You need to be grounded in it. We need to look out for counterfeit teachings we want to be careful for that. That's why we guard what we teach, who teaches, the qualifications, the background of who's teaching, what literature and 
curriculum we teach from because we don't believe don't be spiritually naive don't just take someone's word for something don't just when someone comes and says hey i did a bible study i studied it all out therefore believe this no even the, the church the thessalonians it says in acts that they were more noble that even when paul the apostle came he, he commended the thessalonians he said they were more noble than all because they sought search the scriptures to see if these things were so take it to the mat take it to the book compare it so verses one and two there was this need for discernment and it tells us there that there will be for many false prophets the end of verse one have gone out into the world this is not the first time we've seen one of the apostles tell us this um and that that and what jesus told us in matthew 17 that there are many false teachers in the world there are sheep wolves in sheep's clothing in matthew 7 paul told us that in acts 20 that there were many false teachers that would become in from to the church and even from within the church that there would be false teachers peter told us that in second peter 2 that there were false prophets false teachers and here the apostle john tells us for false prophets have gone out into the world there is fakes so um there, there is an assertion of what is true and what is by, by saying there is false that means there's truth it is strange that we live in a world where the assertion of something being true over something being false is controversial isn't it um to say something is one and not the other um but the scriptures are clear on this so he tells us to one don't believe everything you've you you, you hear don't be spiritually naive and then when it comes to verse two he says but but but, uh, but test the spirits uh, but test the spirits verse two it says by this you know the spirit of god so this is the next the basis of discernment so the need for discernment there's false teachers next is the basis of discernment that 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 the, the, by this when you see that phrase by this that it should close off okay what is this you know the spirit of god so here's the basis here's the test that everyone that confesses that jesus christ has come in the flesh is from god and that everyone does not confess jesus is not from god this is the spirit of antichrist which you heard is was coming and now is in the world so he says so so there are a lot of people who claim to speak for god who do not speak for god there are a lot of messages that come to you in your inbox on your on your on your feed that will claim to be from god that are not from god so how do you know so the there's a the basis of it is to test them against i'm going to use the phrase the apostolic teaching meaning the teaching that came from the apostles that we have in the word of god by this this is the means or the instrument the means or the instrument and he is speaking particularly of the doctrine of christ um, um he's he's this uh he'd already given us this very robust explanation in chapter one um, if you go look back at first john at first john one that which is from the beginning, the preexistence of Christ, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, the incarnation, and looked upon and touched with our hands the physicalness of, of, of Jesus, concerning the word of life, that the life was manifest, and we have seen it and testify it and proclaim to you the eternal life, the Father. I mean, this, all of this, he's, this God, he's, he's already given us his robust Christology, or the doctrine of Jesus. Now, we need to recognize that paul that john is writing into a particular people in a particular time but there's a principle there that's bigger he's dealing with one particular problem and kind of a, a gnostic or proto-gnostic uh might some scholars talk some type of docetism which was the idea these people that believed that jesus was a human and that the christ the messiah the spirit of messiah came upon him at his baptism and left him at some point at the crucifixion um, so he's this human, and he's the Christ, or what? What? So, so they're kind of denying what we just celebrated at Easter, the incarnation of Christ, that God has forever been, in, Christ has preexisted, and He put on flesh. The Word became flesh. They're denying that truth. Now, you could take that teaching. Okay, those that say Jesus has come in the flesh, I could take some cult leaders. 
I could take some uh, heresies and, and false teaching groups uh, in history and current day, and some of them would say, oh yeah, Jesus came in the flesh. Um, but that's not what John's, he is dealing with, he is giving us an example of a test. He is not giving us every test. This is why we need to read scripture with scripture, because he's given us that in other places that we would, that we would do this. Um, that he's not giving us an example of a test. He's not given us every test on this. But essentially what this is, Jesus has come in the flesh. This refers to the, a few of these, it was unpack what the doctrines are in, included in this statement. The pre-existence of Jesus, that Jesus is fully and truly divine, that he is fully human and fully divine. So this idea that he is fully God, fully man, this, this union that we can't explain, that we accept by faith, that, uh, that, that, that is a, um, um, the, the test is what they believe about Jesus, the preexistence of Jesus, that he's fully divine. So, so whether they believe by this, they believe the incarnation, Jesus came in the flesh, that he's the Christ. So this is speaking of the incarnation of Jesus and the office of Jesus as being the Messiah. In the Old Testament, it was the idea of the anointed one. And, the, and that, that idea of the Messiah, or the, 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 and then the New Testament idea that this was the Christos, the Christ, the anointed one of God, that he is incarnate, he is things. So where do we get this? We got this from the apostles. And where has the apostles' teaching been recorded for us? Well, it's been recorded for us in the scriptures. So essentially what he's doing, he's holding this book up, and he's saying, if what they say about Jesus doesn't line up with the apostolic Jesus about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. It is not from God. To hold it up and say, so when you have someone knock on your door and, when you, and, they, and they have a, another testament or another letter, first question is, what do you believe about Jesus Christ? And if it doesn't line up with what this book teaches us about the person of Jesus, and the work of Jesus, it is not a message from God. How Christ and his redemption, what the scriptures say. Um, believers can disagree on many things that are secondary, but these truths about Jesus are foundational. And so the test, the basis of the discernment is what they believe about Jesus and it, that what the Bible teaches about Jesus, his person and work. The basis is not, well, they came and they were very kind. Um, they, 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 they had winsome ideas. They had great literature. Their printing stuff was incredibly attractive. They had this awesome slick video. They had this. The basis is not any of that stuff. Be warned. You know, it, it, we are all sheep and we can all be led astray. I have had dear, sweet, elderly saints that followed Jesus for a long time. And in their later years, when they were homebound and homeridden and, and, and things like that, cult groups came to their house to talk to them. And they enjoyed the kind young person that came with that literature to talk with them. And they enjoyed those weekly visits. And before you know it, they embraced a heretical, false teaching about who and what Jesus did. Beware. Exercise discernment. The test, does this person claim to, who's claiming to speak from God hold to the apostolic teaching of who and what Jesus is? Confess that Jesus, the way that he, what he was spoken of, the way that they spoke about him above, does this teach in accordance with what the Bible teaches about the person and work of Jesus? And if not, it is not from God. So if it's not from God, where is it? Well, glad you asked. It says it right in the text. And everyone that does not confess Jesus is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. So they need to be discerning. You know what? This isn't important for us because... We live in a very pluralistic age, right? And pluralistic people love and affirm pluralistic messages. And they will so appreciate you talking about being a spiritual being and being spiritual and, and embracing the teachings of Jesus. But when you shift 
to what Peter said in Acts 4, that neither is there salvation in any other. And by there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And that there's, that neither is there salvation in any other name whereby under heaven whereby we must be saved. That's where it gets crazy on them. And they, they're, you're intolerant, you bigot. How could you believe that, that, that walking over a cliff isn't good for your health? I mean, how can you, how can you have this exclusivity of truth? Um, and 70% uh, statistics say that of born-again Christians would say that, according to a survey, that other Christian, other religions could lead to heaven. That's a very sad statement, sad statistic. And if that's the case, why even witness? Why even, why even, why even have missions? Are we just wasting our money on missions? Um, um, in 2008, 50% said at least some non-Christian faiths could lead to salvation. Um, a flawed theology that separates the person of Jesus from being the Christ is what John's dealing with. And so, as John MacArthur said it this way, he said that any denial deviation or distortion distortion denial deviation or distortion of the scriptural view of Jesus Christ his incarnation that he is both the son of God and God that he is the promised prophet and redeemer constitutes the spirit of the antichrist and so it says that if it's not from God who is it from it's from antichrist we're not to believe it's from God that says the spirit of antichrist is that it is already in the world now it's not saying it is the antichrist it's the spirit of antichrist the end times eschatological final rebellion against God that is revealed in that man of lawlessness already now is and working in the world we are at war there is a raging now even now in this age against God it is raging so beware that false teachers false doctrines false um, teaching about the person in Jesus these cult groups it is not just oh they have a different view of a doctrinal thing there is a spirit behind it that is a demonic spirit and it says in the text there, it is already now in the world. It is raging against God and his church and the work and the work of the church in the world. It is raging in false prophets. It is raging in false teachers. And they are little antichrists even now in the world. That could scare you, doesn't it? It makes you worry like, wow, what can I believe? This is happening in the world right now. Well, then the third thing that we would see is that we should be encouraged by the greatness of God. And when we come to verse 4, there is an encouragement for the congregation. So, whoa, don't be scared about this. Come to verse 4, and it says this, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. That word overcome or conquered, it's, uh, the, the, the Greek word has that word Nike in it, that conquer, to win. Okay, I mean, you've just... I mean, you, through him, you're, you're, you're dunking on them, okay? That, that you've overcome them. You, for he who is in you, greater is he that's in you than he is in the world. So this is the encouragement. You don't need to be afraid, little children, because you're from God. And you, plural, you all, you guys, y'all, however you say plural you, um, uh, have conquered. You've overcome them. You have conquered them. How did you do that in the beginning of verse 4? Did you do it through political power, military might, going back to the Crusades, getting your politician in? No. How did you do that? Because you held to the truth. You resisted the temptation of false teaching, not by being confused and deceived by them, but by being spiritually discerning. How did you overcome them? By exercising spiritual discernment and clinging to the truth that the apostles have given us. How did you do that? By being smarter than them or, or having a, a better support system or whatever? No, because of the one that you believe, because of the one in them, because the one in you is greater, because of the infinite power of the triune God who in, is in you. I know sometimes we treat the Bible like a quote book rather than as its 
portrayed to us, right? Um, uh, one illustration that might be a modern way to understand it is, is to see the Bible not as like 66 like individual letters, but as a 66 episode series on whatever streaming service you're using. And, and each episode might have its own story, but there's a bigger story with those characters and what's going on as you watch or binge watch um, all those episodes, right? Okay? And, and so we don't always want to take little clips. And maybe, maybe you've seen little clips of a movie or a show, maybe on YouTube, just like the little segment or something like that. And, and you're like, no, 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 but when you fit in the whole story, here's what's going on, right? And, and so many of us have maybe used that phrase, maybe even put it on a coffee cup or something like that. It says, greater who it's in you than he it's in the world. But do you see how seeing that in the context of this false teaching and this need for spiritual discernment and these, the spirit of antichrist and this, these false prophets, how that truth of greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world could be, mean so much more to us? I mean, it really kind of brings that out for us. God is greater than any enemy that you or I will ever face. I mean, God is greater than it. He is infinitely more powerful than the devil or any of his lesser minions, his letter, lesser antichrist or the spirit of antichrist or these, these false teachers that are using the spirit of antichrist and spreading these false lies. Telling these false lies. It's redundant. These lies. So, so we need to don't believe everything you hear. Use the test of what they believe about Jesus, his word, his redemptive work, as the Bible's presented to us. Three, don't be, don't be encouraged by how great God is. And then fourth, as we come to the final section here, verses four and five, the fruit of discernment, we need to recognize the different source that these teachings have. So as we see, we come to um, verse five, it says, they are from the world. And then look at the beginning of verse 6. We are from God. See that contrast? They are from the world. We are from God. So you're seeing this contrast here. So we're going to see this source of their source and versus our source. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. So there's three phrases there that show us the origin of their message, the audience of their message, so they have this worldly message, the origin of this message, the world produces prophets who speak for the world. Makes sense, right? The world produces prophets that speak for the world. And, and so in a pluralistic age, they love another pluralistic message. Come on in. It's plural. You come, uh, the, the world produces prophets that speak for the world. Um, there are prophets emerging from the world. And prophets, their origin is in the world, and so therefore they have a worldly message. Therefore their message, they speak, verse 5 there in the next phrase, from the world. So their message is from the world. It's a worldly message to a worldly audience. Worldly message, worldly audience. They are from the world, and therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We shouldn't be surprised that the world applauds and supports the worldly message of worldly prophets. It's going to happen. Um, they love that. They love heaping to themselves teaching, teachers having itching ears, as, as Paul told us in Timothy. Uh, they, they want it. that's why I mean so there there is a there, there there is a truth that how we test the show spiritual discernment is one what does that person teach about Jesus and then two what does the world think about them or who's celebrating them so someone comes to your door knocks your door I want to do a Bible study I want to I want to give you this literature I want to talk to you about our faith okay what do you teach about Jesus and who's celebrating you okay I mean, and so, so when you see the world and those that would be against God or those that would not believe the Bible all celebrating someone for something, all of a sudden there's a little discernment meters coming off in our head. Like, wait, the world's applauding this? Like, is this, um, this is something we need to be, be careful of. So this worldly message for a worldly audience, um, and then so they contrast that with what we see in verse 6. They're from the world. Um, 
And, um, but we are from God. And it says there, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So, who are the we? Well, it's speaking specifically of the apostles, but it also carries on to those that would carry the message of the apostles, those that would believe and hold. So the you that would believe the message of the apostles, the Bible teaching about Jesus and who he is. So we are from God. Um, and so our, 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 those that are speaking the words of the apostles. So what we want to say is, are we speaking the words of the apostles? Um, so we don't judge a message by the size of the audience, but by how it's being faithful to the truth. Get that? We don't judge a church by the size of the audience, but by its faithfulness to the truth. Okay? Uh, not by the size of the audience, but by the faithfulness. It doesn't mean you don't want to grow the audience. Um, and, 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 but but that, because Jesus sheep hear his voice. But we don't judge it based upon the size of the audience, but by its faithfulness to truth. So when, you, when, when you're looking at a podcast and you're like, oh, this guy's a great preacher. Look, he's got three million followers on YouTube, but this other guy only has 500,000 followers on YouTube. Don't judge it based upon the size of the audience, but by the faithfulness to the truth. The one who knows God, those, so he said there, whoever knows God listens to us. He's not being arrogant. He's saying he's listening to this truth about the, 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 the truth, the true Christ and who he is, the biblical Jesus. And whoever is not from God doesn't listen to us. So the one who knows God listens to us. But those that know God, when they hear that biblical apostolic teaching, there's something there. The Spirit of God's confirming it in them. Um, that there's something, and, and you've had this happen. You've had this happen. You, 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 you're hearing, you're reading something, you're like, that's true. That's true, and it's confirmed. That, uh, that I'm, the, the word, that, that's what this is saying. It's confirmed there. And, and, and those that God, this is actually um, an evidence of someone's being regenerate, someone being saved, that they're listening and leaning in. I mean, you, you, the, you, guys have, you guys have had this. You guess all of a sudden there's someone that really wasn't interested in the things of the Lord, and then they come to you, and they're like, hey, I've been like uh, listening to these sermons by this Piper guy on the Internet or this MacArthur guy, or I was listening to this, and I got this book on this. And, and man, I, and all of a sudden they're coming regularly, and they're, and they're sitting under the Word, and they're talking about this message, and they're reading this in the Bible, and, and they're really in, getting into sermons and, and, or, or what might be, and you're like, whoa, what's going on? Those that are from God are going to be drawn into that, and they're going to be drawn into it, wanting the hunger for the truth and the true teaching of Jesus and that biblical apostolic message of the Bible. And Danny Aiken said in his commentary on First John, he says that people will gra gravitate to and have an affinity for the confession and teaching with which they are most like-minded. So, so people will be attracted to the message and messages and the teaching that they're most aligned. So those that are of the world will be attracted to that worldly message. Those that are of God will be attracted to that biblical message. And that's just how it's going to be. So, um, and it says, by this, again, that's the clue, we know what is true and the spirit of error. This is how we exercise biblical discernment. We exercise, we've seen the need for discernment, the basis of discernment and the fruit of discernment that we should be people that don't believe everything don't be spiritually naive test things by what the bible actually says what does it say about G what is they what do they teach about jesus who's following them uh, uh, what do they say about the this biblical idea of the person and work in jesus his work and then be encouraged by the greatness of god and then recognize the source where they where, from where they're coming from so a few ways to apply this to us. By this, there at the end, the fruit of discernment. Spiritual discernment, a response, how we would respond to the apostolic teaching, the Bible's teaching, whether being favorable or rejecting it, is, is, shows us something here. 
that we need to be spiritually discerning. We need, are we receiving the apostolic teaching favorably is evidence that God is working in us. So we need church. We need doctrinal teaching and preaching. I mean, we don't need less of it in the last days. We actually need more of it in the last days. Um, so that's, that's what it needs to be. That is what is best for us. Um, we want to let other Christ followers know that we here at LCC believe the biblical person and work of Jesus Christ. We want to reflect that on everything we do and say. That, that if someone comes to us and, is, and that they're a Christian, that they're, okay, I want to look for churches in this community that, that I want to test the spirits, those that believe the person and work of Jesus and who he is, his redemption, that he is incarnate, that he is the Messiah, his office, his incarnation. I want to be able, we want to identify with that and help them be able to find us, right? And be in a, in a welcoming way that that's our banner, that we're following, we're with him, we're with Christ. And so there's some practical things we can do as a church to, to, to help people that are followers of Jesus come, become part of that. We can do that in, in statements that we have, what we have on our website, how, what we talk about, what, what, what curriculum and literature we use, um, all those things. Because the church is the custodian of truth in these age. I mean, God preserves truth. He holds it, but he told us in the word that the, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, that the, the New Testament church is this custodian of this truth. We need to hold to it. And so, so there's an application for us that we need to hold to truth and have doctrinally rich biblical teaching. But secondly, we need to really hone in on the, the Christology, which is just a fancy word for the doctrine of Christ, of believing who he is, what he is, things, of, things like that, fully human, fully God, that, 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 that he's divine, that he preexisted, things like we talked about at Christmas time. But we want to really lean in on that doctrine and it not just be all, yeah, we believe in Jesus. No. What, who, 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 what, which Jesus? What did he do? Where is he from? We want to like, we want to have everyone really be, be like, be, be, like learned and understand their faith in Jesus Christ. And then, and we also want to, uh, an application of this for us the church is that we want to be able to recognize false teachers. Um, that we want to make sure that the people that we have teaching here are grounded in the truth and that they're qualified um, and that, that, that to be, and, the, and are believing this. But it's like, oh, hey, everybody's following this new teaching. No, 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 we're going to test it by the word. So does this person who claims to speak for God, so we're going back to full circle at the beginning of this, someone comes and says, hey, I, I heard this, I have peace about this, God told me, I got this. How do you know that's from God or not? Don't believe it. Don't uh, remember there's the uh, test teaching by the Bible number two Be encouraged by God's greatness when you're overcome and recognize the different sources of that teaching so I want you to give a little homework. Maybe you can talk about this at lunch What false teachers? Present themselves to us today Maybe in the media maybe what you see on TV what false teachers are presented to us today and how can what we've seen in this text help us discern truth from error? So I hope that this will help us as we as help you as we've seen this. How can we know whether something is from God or not? Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Christians, there's a lot for you to learn from this. But maybe you're here and you're not a believer. There's something for you to see here that this world is very confusing. And what this passage and this church stands upon is the truth that Jesus really is God. He, re he is eternal. He is perfect. And you and I are not, that we've sinned before him. And that Jesus died. He was the only one. He's the Christ. He is the Messiah who came and took our place on the cross he took the penalty of our sins. He was buried in payment for that. But then to show that God accepted that, he was raised from the dead. And he offers that gift to you, if you'll believe that. This is the gospel. And it's offered to you. 
that you could grow in spiritual discernment to believe the true gospel in the true Messiah, Jesus. That's an invitation to you. But there are some Christians here that need to apply this to their lives as far as when false teaching comes. So let's take a few moments and just apply this to our hearts.